Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam. I'm the pastoral assistant here. I invite you to rise as you are able for today's reading of scripture. Today's scripture comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, Lord, we're so thankful for your word, the truth of your word. It reveals who you are and reveals who we are. Lord, at this time, we pray for your Holy Spirit to work among us. Work in my heart, work in my mind. Um, as I speak, Lord, I know that I'm here as a servant, as your vessel. So I pray that you, you utilize me by your spirit to speak your word. Lord, I pray for all of us here who are here in person, those of us who are joining us online. pray that your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts, work in their minds, because, Lord, we know that our hearts and minds can be hardened, can be closed off, and your Spirit opens our hearts. Your Spirit opens our minds to be ready and to receive your word today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. What would you say to someone who says to you that he or she believes in miracles? Well, I am that someone. It occurred to, on a weekday morning when most people are on their way to work or on their way to school. My brother, who was a high school student at the time, waited with others at a bus stop uh, for the bus to arrive. When I arrived, he was the last one to board the bus, but the bus driver didn't uh, notice him until an accident happened. The front white wheel of the bus rolled over my brother's right leg, while his left leg was cut by the closed door of the bus. I was around seven years old at the time, and it was hard for me to understand why such a thing could happen to my brother. And though I was upset by the situation, I wonder if such an accident could happen to me one day. I was also puzzled by the fact that my brother came out of the accident with only a few scars, not one fracture. The x-ray showed that he did not have a fractured leg. How is it possible that my brother came out of the accident without a fracture? I struggled to find an answer to this question. My mother concluded that it was a miracle. And at that time, I was starting to believe it was a miracle as well. In today's passage, we find that Jesus brings a natural miracle. And so a natural miracle to a few fishermen, and he meets them exactly where they are in life and calls them newness, uh, calls them to newness in their location. Before Luke chapter 5, we find that Jesus was ministering in Capernaum, a city in northern Israel, teaching and preaching in the synagogue about the kingdom of God. He was driving out unclean spirits, healing all those who were sick with various diseases, and when we come to Luke chapter 5, our, our passage this afternoon, Jesus meets a crowd of people. And among them, we meet the first disciples of Jesus and see how Jesus engages them and then how they respond. As we dive into Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, we find that he answers three questions for us this afternoon. The first question is, 
how should we respond when Jesus meets us where we are? How should we respond when Jesus meets us right where we are in our lives? Right where we are in our work, right where we are in our jobs, right where we are in our families, right where we are in our school. What, how should we respond when Jesus meets us where we are in our lives? Second question is, what do we realize about ourselves when Jesus meets us where we are? So the first question really addresses, what do we realize about Jesus? We have, we have a certain response when Jesus meets us where we are. The second one is, well, what do we realize about ourselves? What is something that we learn about ourselves when Jesus meets us where we are? And then lastly, what does Jesus ask of us when he meets us where we are? So let's look at the first one together. How should we respond when Jesus meets us where we are? And this is our first point. When Jesus meets us where we are, we respond with recognition of his power and identity. When he meets us exactly where we are in our lives, whether in our lives when we are broken, whether in our lives in our jobs, or in our schools, in our families, he reaches right into our personal space. And when he does, we respond with recognition of his power and identity. We see this in verses 1 through 6, and also in the beginning of verse 8. I invite you to look with me there. Starting verse 1, we see that on one occasion, while the crowd, so he, Jesus at this point, he has drawn a large crowd. Because prior to this, he was preaching and teaching in the synagogue. He was in Capernaum. He was doing all his healing. He was doing all his teaching. He's become very well known. So he has drawn a crowd. And look what it says. The crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. So for the crowds of people in Galilee, they know, okay, this guy's a big deal. He teaches with authority. He has power and authority. He is someone that we should listen to. He is someone of power. He is someone of authority. We identify something divine about him. And so we ought to listen to what he has said. What he has to say is the word of God. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. He is bringing this word of the good news of the kingdom. We recognize his power and identity when we are listening to Jesus. When we go forth and we look intently and we want to listen to Jesus, it's because we recognize that he is someone of power. He is someone of authority. He is someone that has divine presence. He is the Holy One of divine presence. God sent for Jesus into this world to proclaim the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. And these crowds of people are coming to receive that very thing, the word of God, the message of God. In this context, this is where discipleship begins. This is where following Jesus really all begins. Because in order to follow Jesus, we've got to listen. We have to hear what he has to say. For us, this means, yes, going to the scriptures. And for those of us who have been in church for a really long time, who have been Christians for a really long time, it's sort of like the old saying, it's like beating a dead horse. Right? Go always go to the Bible, right? Always go to the Bible. But it's true. Right? Go into the scriptures. In the scriptures, we meet Jesus. In the scriptures, we hear Jesus. In the scriptures, we get to listen to Jesus. But we're not about to do this on our own. Right? We are invited, you know, whether in our devotional time, our quiet time, we're invited to do this on our own. But we also have opportunities in the church where we get to do this as a community. Like community group, where Rebecca mentioned in our announcements, right? We have a time to gather together, to look at the word, to hear what Jesus has to say, to listen to what he has to say. In the story of God that we've been going through, we've been looking at the prophets, but we try to make it all and see how it all connects back to Jesus, how he is the center of the story. We are listening for Jesus. We are hearing Jesus. It's what our weekly prayer is all about on Tuesday and Friday mornings. We turn to the scriptures and we hear, what does God have to say? What has God has to say? To be a disciple, to begin to be a disciple, to follow him, we got we to have our ears open. We've got to be able, be able to listen. Anyone who wants to follow Jesus, the ear is so important. It's such an important part of our body. So we see, we recognize his power and identity when we choose to listen. When we open our ears and choose to listen to what Jesus has to say, just like these crowds, 
They went and they pressed him out because they want to hear what he has to say because they identify that he is a power. They identify his authority. They identify uh, who he is. We also recognize his power and identity when we choose to not only just listen to him, but also when we choose to obey. And when we choose to obey what he has to say. In verses 1 to 6, we find that Simon obeys Jesus twice. First, when Jesus got into Simon's boat, he asked Simon to put out his boat a little from the shore. And what does Simon do? He obeys. Right? He goes and you know, Jesus gets on the boat and then he tells Simon, can you just put it out a little bit from the shore? Because I want to speak to the crowd and I want to take advantage of the fact that this is a large crowd and I want to take advantage of the acoustics of the lake. So can you just push the boat just a little bit from the shore so I can continue teaching to them? Simon does it. Then Jesus tells Simon to go fishing again in broad daylight, in broad daylight after an unsuccessful night and through some annoyance or even perhaps some protest, Simon obeys. Right? We see this in uh, verse 5. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. Okay? At your word, I will let down the nets. Now, for the second commandment, it wouldn't make sense to any fisherman, right? Just go fishing out in, in broad daylight. And from Simon's perspective, he is getting now advice about fishing from a carpenter slash healer slash preacher, while he himself is an expert fisherman. So he's receiving advice from a carpenter slash healer slash preacher on how to fish. It's as if one of us were to say to NBA player Steph Curry, hey, you know what, Steph? Um, I don't regularly play basketball, but you know what? If you follow what I say, if you do exactly what I say, I guarantee you that you can throw a half-court shot and make it every single time. Sounds good? Will you follow what I say? Now, I would imagine that Steph Curry would have a question mark on his face. If you ever know Steph Curry, who plays for the Golden State Warriors, he actually has a whole compilation on YouTube of him making half-court shots and actually making it. He's like probably called today one of the best well-known shooters right, in, in the basketball league. And if one of us were to say, you know what, we don't really play basketball, but I'll tell you how to play. I'll tell you how, how, how to make those half-court shots. There will be doubt. Steph Curry would definitely have doubt, right? That's his professional career. We're not in that professional care. And we have the right to advise him. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. Simon is hearing this from Jesus, who he knows from the human spirit, Jesus is no expert in fishing. But yet, he's willing to listen Jesus out. He's listening him out, and he also falls through too. Yes, there was a little bit of reluctancy, but Simon still obeys. And we see that he even obeys respectfully. He calls him master. Right? He recognized who he is. He calls him master and he obeys. He was willing to do what Jesus said. Even before he was really sure if it was right. He was still part, still skeptic. Right? Still had some doubts. But there was something about Jesus that he had seen already. Because prior to chapter 5, he already witnessed Jesus heal his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And Jesus came over to his house and healed his mother-in-law. So this is not like the first time, you know, that he has witnessed you know, something extremely uh, special you know, about Jesus. So he goes forth and he, and he does it anyway. But he, he probably still had doubts. And this is encouraging to us because we still have many doubts in our lives, don't we? For Simon, he started to know Jesus for sure. He trusts in his word and he, and he falls through. He takes Jesus at his word. And there are times when we struggle to believe Jesus' word, don't we? There are times when we only believe partly and we, we need Jesus' help to believe more of who he is and what he has done for us. Which leaves us a, question, a series of questions for I invite us to think about. What do you doubt about Jesus' word? Do you doubt about your ability to obey Jesus' command to love someone who has betrayed you, who has hurt you deeply? Do you doubt that Jesus loves and cares about you and is with you when you struggle and are stressed over getting a school or a work project done on time? Do you doubt that Jesus loves and cares about you and is with you in your struggle as a parent or in your anxiety in becoming a parent? 
Do you doubt that Jesus loves and cares about you and is with you when you're feeling lost in life? Questioning, what's the point of life? At these times, I encourage you, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. When you're so broken and you're so lost and you're having all these doubts, could be Satan attacking you? I don't know. But these are the times to go to Jesus and ask him to help you to believe in him as much as you can. Faith is a gift, brothers and sisters and friends. And God gives us to us to the measure that we can exercise it. So go to him. Go to Jesus and ask him to help you to believe in him as much as you can. When Jesus meets us where we are, we respond with recognition of his power and of his identity. We recognize his power and identity when we listen and obey him. So far, we realize something about Jesus, his power and identity. But what do we realize about ourselves when Jesus meets us where we are? Which brings us to our second point. When Jesus meets us where we are, we realize our own unworthiness and sin. When Jesus meets us where we are in our life, whether we are a father or a mother, we're a worker, we're a student, we're broken in our own work, we just feel like we're lost in life. When he meets us exactly where we are, we realize our own unworthiness and sin. We realize that we are before someone who is called worthy, and we are unworthy to stand before him. We realize someone who is pure and holy, who is of the divine, the presence, divine presence. In us, we are sinners. We are sinners. And we see this in verses 8 through 10. I invite you to look with me there. Verses 8 through 10, it says, But when Simon Peter saw it, when he saw the, the boat was filled with fish, when, he, when they followed Jesus' command to cast out their nets into the, into the lake and to uh, fish again, their boats were filled. And in verse 8, But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Yeah, let's stop there. So we see in the words, depart from me. Right? See in Simon's words, depart from me. In these words, Simon realizes that he is in the presence of someone who is holy. He realizes who he is, that Jesus, you don't deserve to be near me. This, this isn't right. You are someone who is holy. I feel like I need to run from you. I need to escape from you because I can't be in your presence. So he asks someone, depart from me. And he says, in the words, I am a sinful man. Simon realizes the sin and brokenness in his life. He realizes that he is standing before someone who is holy. And he realizes when he stands before someone who is holy, he realizes himself, he is not. He is the exact opposite. In these words, Simon is showing repentance. He's showing the beginning stages of repentance, of turning away from his sin and turning towards Jesus. In order for us to follow Jesus, we have to turn away from our sin. God will not stand for sin, so we need to turn away from our sin. Every disciple, every follower of Jesus must come to a point where they realize the depth of their own sin the depth of their uncleanliness, the depth of their unworthiness. And that helps them get to the point of repentance. The way that we're able to see ourselves as we really are, the depth of our sin, the ugliness of our sin, is when we see who Jesus really is, the beauty of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus. A similar thing happened with the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, a well-known passage of the call of Isaiah. He says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Woe to me, for I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he, when he sees a vision of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord, he realizes how unclean, how unclean he is, how unclean he is. And this is what happens to Simon. And he falls down at Jesus' knees, worshiping him, revering him. And this is not just like repent of a, you know, a specific sin, right? Because for Simon, it's like, I'm a sinful man. It's his whole life. 
It's his whole being. That's what we're called to, to repent of our entire selves, our sinful selves. Every disciple comes to a point where, like Simon says, I am a sinful man. I am a sinful woman. But the thing about when we see our own sin, we tend to want to run away, don't we? We feel ashamed. Right? It's similar like the Garden of Eden where when Adam and Eve realized they were naked, right? they, were felt, they felt ashamed. They wanted to hide. But here, in the, in the scripture, it tells us that we have no reason to be ashamed. Jesus on the cross, he bore our guilt and shame. We have no reason to be ashamed. But sometimes we do feel this way. And it's natural for us to, in this time to come before the Lord, to come to Jesus, to cling to him, to realize that because of him, we have no need to be ashamed. We have no need to, be, to feel ashamed of who we are. This is why Jesus came, to take our shame away. He came to bring us closer to God. He is the way for us to bring us to the Lord. So, but rather than pushing Jesus away, we should cling to him. We should go to him, cling to him, repent of our sin, and ask for the forgiveness that only he can offer to us. So far, we've seen from our text this afternoon that when Jesus meets us where we are, we respond with recognition of his power and identity, and we realize our own unworthiness and sin. With all this, what is Jesus, Jesus really asking of us? And this brings us to our third and final point. When Jesus meets us where we are, he calls us to follow him. He calls us to follow him. And there's two, there's two dimensions of, of this, and we going to see this in verses 10 through 11. I want you to look with me there. Verses 10 through 11, we'll pick it up at the second part of verse 10. And it says, And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. To follow Jesus involves two things, at least in this passage. It says, catching men and leaving everything. What's really interesting about this catching men is that it's a Greek word that's a combination. It's a compound word. For one, it means catching. The also other part of the word is Live, alive. So what is actually going on here is, is Luke is saying that, do not be afraid, from now you'll be catching men alive. Which is in contrast to what fishermen do. When fishermen, when they go out and they, and they fish, they're catching fish in the, and they bring it up to the boat, but then the fish are gasping for air. Right? And eventually they're going to be flayed, right? and then they're going to be devoured. The imagery is the opposite. Jesus is telling Peter and telling all those who are followers of Jesus, you're going to be catching men alive. You're going to send out this net of the gospel, of the grace of God. And they're going to be in that net to bring them to life, not to bring them to death. Jesus tells Peter, don't be afraid. He tells him, don't be afraid. And it seems to be he's afraid because he's in the presence of someone who is holy. He knows how unworthy he is. But Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. There's a place for you. There's a place for you. You recognize your own sin. You recognize your unworthiness. You humble yourself before me. There's a place for you. God can still definitely use you. And when we look through the Bible, we look through the book of Acts, that came certainly true. He could definitely be used following his repentance. It was an act of service. And it's, about, and it's about catching men. It's about bringing people to know Jesus Christ so that they can really find true and everlasting life. And this is true for all of us who are followers of Jesus. It's about telling people about Jesus. It's casting that gospel net. It's casting that net of God's grace so that people can find true life. How do we do that? Well, maybe it's just as simple as, or maybe as difficult as inviting neighbors to a Bible study, to one of our community groups. Maybe it's bringing our friends to church, whether it's here in person or watching online together. Or a difficult thing that I still find difficult, speaking to family members about Jesus. 
or it's telling about the God's goodness in our daily lives, or supporting and sending out foreign missionaries. These are a number of things that we can do where we cast this gospel net, the net of God's grace, so that they can find, people can find true and everlasting life. But let's be clear. We're not doing this because of our own ability. Um, as we remember two weeks ago, this is all by the power of the Spirit. Right? We are trusting in the sovereignty of God when we do this. And there are times where we're going to feel like when we talk about Jesus, when we invite people to Bible study, when we invite people to church, whether in person or online, we're going to feel like things are ineffective, at least in our human eyes, that um, nothing is really working because we only see things on the outside, right? But we don't know what's happening inside of a person. Right? We don't know how God is working in, in the hearts of people. So that's never a reason for us to stop sharing about Jesus. That's never a reason for us to not bring people to church, whether in person or online. That's not a reason for us to not bring them to a Bible study group or to our prayer group. Because we don't know exactly what the results will be. We cast the gospel net. Right? It could come back full. It could come back empty. You know, that's not our call. Right? That's up to the Lord. Right? That's up to his sovereignty. We're, our part is casting that net. He, we cast that net, and God will use it. He will save. We also find that following Jesus also God's leaving everything behind, which seems to be a very daunting task, isn't it? Leaving everything, really? Everything behind? You know, it seems from Simon's perspective, he, he left a lot. Right? Seems like he left his whole vocation as a fisherman behind. He left his boat, he left his nets, right? and he just went off and followed Jesus. For us today, I think leaving everything behind can be leaving things like our own selfish ambition. It can be leaving things that are sinful, leaving our comfortability, leaving grudges behind, leaving idols behind, and choosing the right way to live, the, one, the, lay, the way to live that is Christ calls us to live. Jesus doesn't want just one part of our lives. Right? He wants the entirety of all of us. He demands all of us. Maybe leaving everything behind means um, giving up what we want so that we actually have what Jesus really wants for us. This response of leaving everything kind of raises a question for us. Right? Must disciples mean uh, leave their vocations? Does it mean leaving their current jobs? Does it mean that for any of us who are in our church, we need to leave it in order to actually serve Jesus, to be fishers of men. And we look through the New Testament, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, for example, the Apostle Paul, right, he continued to be a tent maker as an apostle, right, while he continued to preach the gospel, going from synagogue to synagogue, and from city to city. He still kept his trade as a tent maker. So the call to walk with Jesus, the call to leave everything behind, as one commentary I read uh, points out, it's about setting Jesus as your priority. Jesus is your priority in everything that you do. Jesus is a priority so that we are prepared uh, to be wherever he wants us to be, to do whatever he wants us to do. For some, it may mean, yes, going out to the mission field. For some, it means staying here and being a good witness to our family and friends. For others, it means realizing that our job, where we are in our work, that is our ministry field. You know, I hear some people say that you know, ministry is, is church, you know, it's church work, you know, but that's not true. For all of us who are followers of Jesus, where we work, where we're as a student, where we're as an employee, that is our ministry. That is our ministry. And maybe Jesus, he's, saying, he's calling you to place in him as a priority. He is your priority in the place of where you are working. And sometimes where we work, it's the best place to cast that gospel net, the net of God's grace, and see what God does. What are the things that you need to leave behind? Selfish ambition, comfortability, selfish desire. What are the things that in your own life that puts you to not set Jesus 
as a priority. So what do we see from this text? In some way, we see that when Jesus meets us where we are, we recognize his power and identity, our unworthiness and sin, and we are called to follow him. Jesus met me when I was seven years old. The Sunday after my brother's accident, I went to my church uh, with, my bro- with my mother and shared with my Sunday school teacher what had happened to my brother. I shared with him my fear that something like this could happen to me, especially since my parents were or- weren't always around uh, to protect me. I told him that I was puzzled, but yet glad uh, that my brother came out of the accident without a fracture. I asked him if there was an answer to my puzzlement, and he asked if I had considered Jesus as someone who was with my brother that day. He encouraged me to talk to my mom about my thoughts and my feelings. And as I shared with her about these things, I came to realize that she thought and felt the same way. She told me that she was amazed that my brother came out of the accident uh, with only a few scars and a swollen leg. However, she came to the conclusion that, that Jesus was with my brother that day and that the accident could have been much worse if he was not watching over my brother. And she described it as a miracle. Then the next few weeks later, I kept thinking about the responses of my mother and Sunday school teacher. In addition, I was, the fear that an accident could happen to me was growing, and I started to develop this need for protection. I came to realize that there were moments every day when my parents were not around. And who was I to depend on when my parents were not around? Coincidentally, my Sunday school teacher was going through a series um, on how sins from our lives affects us presently and eternally. My Sunday school teacher emphasized that sin separates us from having a healthy relationship with God. I was starting to consider God as someone who could protect me daily. But at the same time, I did not feel right asking him about this. Why? Because I felt unworthy. I felt it wasn't my place to really ask God to protect me. Because I know that I wasn't such a great kid. If you were to ask my brother, he would tell you I was a really violent kid. Whenever we played games that would reverse each other, I, what I would do is I would take, I would find like batteries, like double A batteries, and I would throw them, or nine ball batteries, and I would throw them. I was a very violent kid. So I, I, I didn't feel right you know, about going to God, you know, asking Him to protect me. I just felt unworthy to do that. But then I did come to realize that I needed to be protected from the consequences of my own sin. So I brought this up to my Sunday school teacher, and he reminded me that God sent his son Jesus to die and to be raised back to life for the forgiveness of our sins. And if we put our faith in his son, we would be forgiven and have a healthy relationship with him. And I saw this as the call. I saw this as Jesus, through my Sunday school teacher, calling me to help me realize this deep truth that he came to die for me he came to die for me he came so that i could put my faith in him so that i can actually have a healthy relationship with the lord this is when things that i have been learning in sunday school became real to me this is when jesus became real to me his power his identity became real to me and that's when i decided to put my faith in jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, and came to believe that God was with my brother on that day, that his power, who he was, he was with my brother on that day of his accident, and asked God for God's daily protection from the many dangers I face in life. See, I came to a point when Jesus met me where I was, a seven-year-old little boy who was understanding, who needed protection, who sensed a need for protection, and through Jesus, he offered it to me. I recognized his power and identity. I recognized my unworthiness and my own sin. And through my Sunday school teacher, I felt the call. I felt the call to follow him. I felt the call to be a disciple. I hope that is true for all of you. That you come to a point that you realize where you are in life. Because Jesus will step into your personal space just like Jesus stepped into Simon's personal space to make him realize who he was, his power, his identity, his own unworthiness and sin, and the call to follow him. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for all that he has done for us on the cross. Lord, we pray that, um, that this truth would dig deep into our hearts and to our minds. Lord, I pray that for us who are followers of Jesus, maybe we've been followers of you for a long time, I pray that we would give us opportunities to think back to how you met us, how you took the initiative to meet us where we are, to see our brokenness, to see your beauty, and to witness and to hear your call upon our lives. Lord, I pray for all of us who don't know Jesus yet. I pray that your, your spirit will work in them. I pray that your spirit will work in them to help them realize their brokenness, help them realize their own words in their own heart, and to heed the call to follow you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.